over time get over the shame that you were talking about because silence and shame are co-conspirators of suffering. Yeah, check it out, man. This is your boy Akon, and right now you're tuned in to the Millionaire Student Show with my man, Sasha Governor. Yo, it's Rich the Kid on the Millionaire Student Show. Hi, I'm Ariane Celeste, and you're tuning in to the Millionaire Student Show. What's up, y'all? Tune in to the Millionaire Student Show with Andy Milanakis. Yo, yo, this your boy, Soldier Boy. You're tuned in to the Millionaire Student Show with Sasha. Keep it locked right here. Ugh. Welcome to the Millionaire Student Show and today we're going to be focusing um, on one of the four pillars, you know, four pillars meaning health, wealth, spirituality and relationships. And we're going to go so deep into it with, the, with light, wisdom. But today I've got um, Adapia and uh, Adapia Dorico, Vice President of Strategy at Alpha Investing. Um, she's a passionate and visionary leader in both established and startup environments as a founder and executive in new media, technology investment, management, and real estate. So thank you so much for being here. I really and truly appreciate your time. Um, you know, I'm going to go into, well, she's going to talk about women empowerment. We're going to talk, we're going to go so deep into, um, you know, the mind and, you know, the paradigms. But first things first, um, you know, let's go into your roots. Who is Adapia? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. Well, thank you for having me. Um, one of those, uh, one of the things about when we ask, like, who are you? Usually, we're like, well, I'm my title, or I'm this relationship, or I'm all these different things. But I think a great way to approach it is your values. And who I am is somebody who really appreciates knowing myself, being true to myself. I value relationships, I value integrity, I value community and collaboration. And so I think those are some of the things that best describe me as a person and my approach to life in general. So I take that out into the world so that that's who I am. Amazing. <laughs> so um, born and raised in Canada mm -hmm. and you got family in, in Italy. Yes. That's an amazing combination. Yes, yeah. Um, so, I mean, de define authority through uh, authenticity and uh, how you arrived at this philosophy. Sure. So, authority through authenticity is a philosophy of mine that I developed over the years. And it actually specifically developed as a curriculum when I was mentoring MBA students here in LA at USC Marshall, so second year MBA students, and working with them a little bit like life coaching, um, getting them to understand the importance of self-inquiry and self-reflection, like knowing ourselves. Because when we know ourselves so fully and strongly, we make better decisions. Not at all. Right? And so authority through authenticity is, is a philosophy and somewhat of a program based on those principles of really understanding who I am, uh, what I deeply desire, what's meaningful to me, and the ability to make a better decision from that place. Because we generally, when we don't have a deep contemplative practice and we haven't done personal development work like you yeah. know, we were talking about with you, um, we don't know what we don't know. And we especially don't know ourselves. And to know ourselves, we have to go in and find that inner authority authority, which is the only thing that really matters. And so if we can give ourselves what we need, then it spills over into being able to have better relationships with other people because we don't expect them to fill a need that we really have to fill for ourselves. And so it's that inner authority that becomes the basis from which we live our lives. And I feel like um, you know, it plays a huge role of giving yourself permission because mm -hmm. most people don't give themselves permission to actually conquer something or conquer a goal or actually go down the path. Um, they follow the crowd, major the majority. Um, when you're training and mentoring people, um, how do you help them find themselves? Like how much of detail do you go into? Do you go into their past? Mm. Do you pick it up from a point or do you kind of clear the past and say, hey, you know, we're only focusing on what we can see and mm. not what, we what we've experienced. 
Right, that's a great question because it goes into the realm of psychology and therapy, which I'm, you know, I'm not. I've studied psychology, yeah. um, but to be re like a registered psychotherapist is is like a whole endeavor. And I really recommend whenever people want to do really deep past life or relationship type of work, always to work with a therapist. Um, but when I'm working with people on the mentoring side, we take kind of an inventory of of life, of like the ups and the downs, and it's called a lifeline. So we, we look at, you know, the highest and the lowest moments on a scale and what got you through the low points and, you know, how, how life is like this. You know, it's not this, this path that's always up and it's not like this and it's these ups and downs. And so when we can take a step back from our lives and look at it as a whole, we start to see A, a pattern, Right, because everything is that pattern, and yes. we start to see the pattern of our lives, and also to evaluate in those, let's say, the low points, how we were feeling, what we might have been thinking, um, and seeing it with enough of a distance to have a lot of compassion as we see ourselves. But to see who was I in that moment, what was I looking for, what was I trying to do, and most of the time, actually all of the time, we're all just trying our best to get along, to survive, to live, to get what you know, to get what we want, and so it really starts with, uh, with that, and then we can start to find the patterns um, that are really the patterns in ourselves, and then you go from there and work with those. Um, but really, the practice is an ongoing daily practice that we each have to practice on ourselves. So, like, I'm a guide on the side. But even for me with, with myself, it's a daily constant. I'm, I always say I'm babysitting my own ego. Yes. Like I'm always watching myself and, and trying to improve and finding where I may be hindering myself and learning to see those patterns and remove them over time. Um, so what I'm trying to get at is it's a personal daily practice, right? It's like exercise. Like you have to be consistent and you have to be disciplined. Um, but having somebody there to help guide you is really the role. And it's not a bad thing. I mean, it's not a bad thing to have someone guiding you. It's mm -hmm. Because people feel like, hey, I'd rather keep it within myself because I'm, I'm afraid what people might think of me or what people might perceive of me. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, having that guidance and that mentorship from, from a, from a you know, fourth eye just makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, I always say there's three phases, you know, that most people go through. Um, they go through prosperity, and you could go through prosperity first in life, mm -hmm. and then you go through adversity after prosperity. Mm -hmm. So the people who went through that pinnacle, they hit the pinnacle, mm -hmm. deep down they feel like that's what's going to happen forever. The minute that test starts to come through, yeah. majority is taken out the game. And then you go through a plateau in life, mm -hmm. and where there's no room for growth, and you're just going through a huge midlife crisis and a testing phase, and... It just, it's a wave. It goes over, mm -hmm. in and out. And um, so have you, be, have you how, well, firstly, how have you beaten the odds, won and continue to win in life? Um, well, I think based on what you just said, we were saying like life is a wave. So, you know, we have highs and lows and there's a level of that strength. I just know. I just, there, that's that inner authority. That's that, that, what I like to call the soul. It's just like that part of me that just knows I'm always going to be okay. And I have a really strong um, spiritual practice so that I, I feel that way about myself. And I have a great community around me. So one of the things that I've really been able to do is over time get over the shame that you were talking about because silence and shame are co-conspirators of suffering like we don't say the things that we really want to say even to ourselves because there's this it's like it lives over our head it's like this thing of shame and it's the fastest way to keep us down but when we start to share ourselves with other people like a guide or a mentor or a group we get into that space of permission and when we give ourselves permission to be vulnerable and real then we give other people the same. And those people become this community, this supporter. I have a sisterhood. You know, I have a family. I have people that I can turn to. But it, always was, it wasn't always like that. I always tried to do everything by myself. Yeah. And whenever I tried to do everything by myself, I wouldn't ask for help. I wouldn't get feedback. So I would only have one perspective 
of my mind, which is the worst perspective <laughs> to have when you're trying to accomplish anything of value. Um, and so getting through the low points was really my biggest learning lessons of like, what was I trying to accomplish? Where did I go wrong? What could I do better? And it's come back to understanding myself and having a certain level of courage to be really open and honest with other people. And that's built these relationships that now support me so that when I do come up against a challenge, it can still be really difficult. Like you feel the emotion and, and you know, practical things happen, but it's not as tragic in my mind. Like it's not a tragedy. It's just part of life. So there's resilience and grit and lots and lots of learning, forgiving myself, compassion. Forgiving yourself, because yeah. what starts to happen is, um, you know, and that's one of the biggest reasons why suicide, you know, takes mm -hmm. place today, because, you know, it, it's that build up. Yeah. Forgiving yourself, because yeah. what starts to happen is, um, you know, and that's one of the biggest reasons why suicide, you know, takes mm -hmm. place today, because, you know, it, it's that build up. And most people just don't forgive themselves. Do you believe um, that actually comes from, you know, the foundation, their parents, grandparents, and it starts to build up because you've looked at those patterns and the frequency that people go through where they start to pick up the baggage, mm. the past baggage? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's sad even in, um, like, scientific uh, research or psychological research that the first seven years of our lives are the most important where we, uh, we literally absorb our conditioning from the people around us. And when we don't know this about ourselves, when we don't do personal development work or inner reflection or any of this work, even as adults, we're living other people's lives because we're living the patterning and the conditioning that we received and absorbed because we're little computer absorbers, you know. Yeah. And if we don't examine those and ask ourselves, do I believe that? Or is that a cultural belief? Do I still, is that belief helping me? Yes or no, I mean, the most, the, we're so powerful because we can choose. It's the greatest power that we have is choice. And we can choose what to believe. We can choose how to act. And we always know from the inside if a choice is right for us. And getting to know ourselves help us, helps us understand when we're receiving those signals, usually in our body. Um, but we have to unravel that conditioning to really get to the heart of who we are and make those better decisions because we didn't come to this world to repeat. Correct. Right? We came here to pioneer. And that means taking everything that we thought we were, everyone who we were told we should be, and questioning if that's really who we are and who we want to be and how we want how we want to be in the world. Yeah, and especially with um, you know parents that are bringing their kids into this world, it is a huge responsibility because oh yeah. that's where it comes from. It's like some kids wake up and they're born into an environment, and they feel like, hey. Why is it that this person is more successful? Why does mm -hmm. this person live a better life than me? And what they don't realize is it's the parents. The parents actually create that pattern. Mm -hmm. yeah. So how important is it from, an ad, from, from a parent's perspective that if you've messed up in your life, mm -hmm. if you haven't had success, don't let your kids suffer. Mm -hmm. Don't let your kids pay the price mm -hmm. because... You know, you just, you, you don't want to innovate as a parent. You don't want to go the extra mile. It's not just sending your kid to the best school and, yeah. you know, going out there and, you know, sending them on the best vacations and giving them the best first car, best home. Mm -hmm. It's way beyond that, the first seven years. Yeah, the first seven years. If one has that level of awareness of self, I think what, what, it would look like to me, and I'm not a parent, but I know some wonderful, wonderful parents. I think it's the most important job in the world. It's su like you said, it's such a huge responsibility. Um, but it's, it's like your job is to let your child be who they are and not be who you want them to be or who yes. you didn't get to be. So you have, it's like bringing that level of awareness to, um, to them and allowing, that, allowing them to emerge whatever they actually are, letting that emerge as opposed to trying to fit it into a box. Because that's the mistake we make as society is all these boxes that we fit into and then if we're not careful, we believe it. And they're prisons, but <coughs> they're not 
they're mental prisons. They're not real, and yet they act real because we act upon them. I mean, it, it's that whole mental, it's that whole mental paradigm. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, for parents, it's really, can you let your child be who they want to be and who they really are? And can you support them to be that in the best possible way? And sadly, I mean, it's like you get in this environment where one parent starts to compare, you know, their kid to, I mean, the other, the other, the other kid and also friends, you know, parents are have friends and they start to compare because of the whole academic environment mm -hmm. and um, I call that the me factor mm. because specific kids they have a me factor within them right. it's always the sibling makes it and the other one doesn't mm. or sometimes both make it or both of them not, sometimes none of them make it right. but the whole comparison because I grew up in that environment okay. where I have a sister two years older than me and um, there was a lot of comparison yeah. you know, of hey you know your younger brother is doing much better than you. It was a build-up. I watched my sister mm -hmm. psychologically. It started to eat her up within. Yeah. And then deep down, you know, a few years later, she was trying to catch up for what was wasted time in her life. Uh -huh. um, how do you prevent comparing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, uh, that's such a, it's a big topic. Um, I look at, us as people, right, as um, this inner authority, the soul, and then there's the, there's the ego, so the ego and the soul. Um, and the ego operates from a fear-based paradigm, uh, puts things in the labels and boxes, tries to understand. The ego contrasts, compares, and competes. So in order to understand ourselves, even when we're little, like as, as, a, as a function of survival, we are looking and finding differences and similarities. But we start with contrasting this, this versus that. Okay, so now I understand what that is in here. And then as we kind of get older, we, it changes into now I'm comparing better or worse, black or white. It's, then that judgment comes in, which is a big piece of how the ego operates and what that judgment creates separation which is why so many people think that they are not someone else or that they're different, better than. And that, that competing judging is highly toxic. And then, it, and then it moves into compete. It's just this scale. So you start by contrasting, then you're comparing, and then you're competing because the judgment has become so strong that your value needs to be asserted through competition. And that's 100% the ego. Because our true self doesn't need to compete. Yes. And it's a, it's a paradigm that needs to be reconditioned or retrained in people, in ourselves. Like, we have to reparent ourselves, right? Because our parents are just like us. They're people. They're trying their best. They don't know what they don't know. And so as we grow older and we get to that point where we can say, well, now I have to reparent myself. It's actually a term that's used a lot in psychology as well where we have to give ourselves what we think we didn't get, and maybe we didn't get it, and that's okay. So what can I give myself? And that's part of this contrast, compare, and compete, which is, do I need to compete? Because when you start to really understand who you are and have that inner authority and honor yourself, you don't need to compete with anyone. I know who I am. Yeah. I, and I honor you for who you are. I honor you for your differences, because I know that we're actually very much the same. Yeah. And then there's that build up where now you're trying to cover up from what your parents didn't give you, so there's this hate. Yeah. And that's where, you know, what starts to happen is that whole baggage from, you know, you've carried your parents' baggage in that first seven years. Mm -hmm. But as you start to develop, hey, you know, I've wasted some time or I'm not who I really am or mm -hmm. what starts to happen is, now you need to go out there and, and psychologically align yourself, but forgive yes. your parents. Very and I came from, a, from an environment where my parents were separated since I've been two years old. Okay. So my mom and my dad probably didn't see eye to eye from two till when I was two years old till almost 22 years old. Okay. And I had my mom on one side trying to be the better parent. Mm. And my, I had my dad on the other side trying to be the better parent. And I could have you know, flipped on either side. But, you know, today, separation, divorce is more common than ever. Yeah. 
And what starts to happen is picking and choosing as well as hating is something that's so toxic nowadays in an environment. Um, you know, they say people are getting divorced more than people actually failing in university right now. I was mm. reading an article about that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about women empowerment. Mm. Mm -hmm. So let's go back into women empowerment and talk about, you know, for a long period of time, it's always been male dominant. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you've been traveling between Europe and you lived in Europe for, was it? 11 seven, years. 11 years. Yeah and then moved to North America for about seven years. I've been in LA for seven years, for yeah. Seven. So I was in Canada until I was about 20, and then I was in Europe for 11 years, and then I've been in LA. What are some of the, you know, move from Europe to, and I'm from Africa, so Europe, Africa, and I'll bring up Africa's point, but mm -hmm. North America as well. Um, have you found patterns in, in you, know, um, you know, women going out there and striving to become the best version of themselves? Mm. It's very different, and granted, I've been away for seven years, so I, you, the world changes so quickly, yeah. it's hard to say. And also within Europe, there's different cultures. So I lived in Italy for seven years, I lived in Brussels, and I lived in the Netherlands. And so even between the Netherlands and Belgium, it's different than Italy, but let's speak about like the difference for me between Canada, North America, and Italy. One of the biggest challenges I had when I lived there was what felt like a culture of no versus the North American mindset of if you want something, you go for it. You make yourself. You, if you try hard, it's, all, like, it's the concept of meritocracy, of a growth mindset, of growing and making something happen. And that's my mindset. And I'm also very independent. I'm very ambitious, yeah. all these things. And so when I moved to Italy, a lot of people said no, or mostly they said you can't, or they said don't bother, which was very shocking to me because I said, why wouldn't, what do you mean? Why wouldn't you try? You're supposed to try. Yeah. Like if you don't try, you're not going to get anywhere. Um, so it was almost like a fatalistic culture because they have so much. It's heavy. It's heavy culture. It's a beautiful culture, but in some ways it binds them to impossibility. And I fought that without knowing it. I know this now because I've been able to look back on myself, but there's a certain sense of fatalism in the sense of, well, this is how it is and I can't change it. And so they don't try and therefore it doesn't change. Um, whereas here, you know, it's like, no, I'm gonna change that. That's not right, I'm gonna do something about it. And if you can get enough momentum behind it, the right people, you can definitely make change. So it is very different. I mean. The cultural roles are also prevalent. It was very hard for me when I moved there as 22, 23 year old um, with two business degrees, with work experience to find a job. Because I, as a archetypally, I don't exist there. People don't finish school until yeah. they're 30. And so I had to fight that. And it was you know, very challenging. So, and the, you know, businesses are run by men and dealing with that. and very difficult because I had to put up with a lot of um, behavior that, you know, is, has never been okay, but especially today is, is, um, is you know, obviously very frowned upon. Yeah, I mean, so I believe, you know, you get Africa right mm -hmm. in the bottom with regards to opportunities out there, mm -hmm. Europe, and then you get North America, United States. So. With the, with the opportunities that we're giving today, yeah. it plays a huge role. Yeah. I mean, um, and you just said 30 years old, that's, that's the environment. People, are, they have, they've, I wouldn't say wasted their life because education is not bad, mm -hmm. but they also have been deprived of going out and being themselves and doing something outside the traditional route of life. Mm -hmm. I mean, today, nowadays, out here in, in, in USA, if people waking up at 18 years old embracing entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, they're not going to that traditional route. Mm -hmm. um, a typical example, I mean, I, I come from an, a background where both my mom and my dad have one, two, or even three degrees, and I've got nothing. Yeah. And my, my sister, on the other hand, has one degree. So, um, you know, it's all about passion, though. It all boils down to passion. Yeah. So, you're the founder of Real Health, Real Wealth. What is the purpose behind that? I mean, what yeah. made you create that? Yeah, so um, a couple of years ago, I was at the 
probably the peak of my career in financial technology. So um, a couple of years ago, I was at the probably the peak of my career in financial technology. So I have about a 20 year career spanning finance, entrepreneurship, real estate. Um, and this was around the summer of 2017. And I was really feeling like there's something more that I need to be doing. I'm a successful woman. I'm a successful executive uh, in the financial technology industry and the real estate industry here locally. And um, it's always been a passion of mine to write. And so I did something very unusual for myself, which is I, I gave myself permission to express that creativity. So I launched a blog called Real Wealth, Real Health, and um, it was just me wanting to write about the things that I had really started to key into myself. Um, m how my beliefs around wealth and health were so distorted that they led me down distorted paths. So, for example, um, I say, I always thought that um, wealth was the highest number in my bank account and health was the lowest number on the scale. And so I made decisions based on those paradigms. And those did not necessarily lead me in good directions, right? Because wealth is not just money. Yeah. And health is definitely not skinny. And I had body dysmorphia, like I had a lot of like eating, eating disorders, like all that kind of stuff. Like I really abused my body. And then on, let's say like the wealth side, like going after only money or only title on all those things, like you're missing out on what actually is meaningful in life that isn't money per se, but it's the quality of your relationships. It's the abundance of love that you have in your life. And so I really started to build off of a gratitude practice and that really started to shift things around for me. So Real Wealth, Real Health started as that. Now it's a podcast. Um, as I've shifted more into uh, writing on my personal website um, and doing the speaking and the, and the workshops that I do and my podcast where I talk to people about real meaning because for me wealth and health were things that I learned from but it really ultimately led me to what's meaningful and so that's what I talk about on the podcast which is like you know, what's meaningful to you? How did you find meaning? Do you live uh, a meaningful life? And, and all of those decisions. So it's a little bit about people's stories, kind of like what we're talking about, yeah. but also a bit of awakening. Like when I woke up to meaning and how much that shifted my life. Yeah. I mean, um, you're on the brink of launching your very first book, mm -hmm. um, J Journey Home to the Soul. Mm -hmm. um, talk to us about it. Yeah. So Journey Home to the Soul is... Um, is a, a little bit of an autobiography um, mixed in with a lot of the self-reflection and self-inquiry practices that led me to understand this moment that I had back in uh, the summer, early summer of 2011 when um, I left my first marriage. And I had this moment, it was a moment of, a, of awakening. I say my soul set me on fire. Uh, it was really like, uh, just a crazy moment in my life because I had been living against what I knew to be true for a really long time, but I just didn't, you know, you try to make things work. Like, there's all yeah. the reasons why you do things. Um, and so it was just this moment where it was just like, this can't, you have to go, this can't be your life anymore. Um, and so that was also a public talk that I gave, um, which became a viral video uh, on Goldcast. And so the book is me reflecting and using a, a variety of practices that I've developed for myself. Um, one of them, I call it compassionate re-experiencing. So in the process of going back to give this speech that I gave about that moment and about my life and what I learned from it, I had to really dig back into my life in a very, very deep way um, that really took me emotionally into who I was. And I, have, and I had to see myself with such compassion such compassion and forgiveness because I didn't realize it for all these years from that moment until like last year when this all happened, the, vid, um, the speech and the book, I had still been living in shame about leaving that marriage, about hurting all the people that got hurt, you know, the, the, and it was all in my mind and so I had to let that all go. And so the book is a bit of a, 
and so it's a bit of an autobiography about also seeing the path that led me there, all the signs and the signals, all the way I ignored my intuition, all the ways I ignored my heart, you know, that's that, that inner authority of like, man, like I really was like, no, I, my mind was like, no, but this is what I want, like, no, 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 and just pushing everything else down at the expense of, of my heart and soul. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens so, like, people start to develop success and eventually they pay the price. Mm -hmm. If you're not paying the increments, you're going to pay it in a huge lump sum in due time. And it's a build-up. It's like, you know, you have the success at 65 years old. You know, you're utilizing all the money you've made to repay your health. Yeah. And um, we see it nowadays. We see it nowadays more than ever with regards to, um, I mean, not, not really with the millennials because they're moving towards the whole tech world and they're moving towards everything is digital. And mm -hmm. it's, um, so there's a lot of pros and cons to old school business as well. Um, how do you mentor others for success? Um, I feel like every interaction is an opportunity for me to be very present and to offer to a reflection. Like I see you, I hear you, I honor you. And I try to take that approach with everything and with everyone. Um, I have a formal mentoring program at USC and that's kind of where I built up this, this curriculum, but generally I feel like the best way for me to mentor is to be authentic, is to be myself and to be very open and vulnerable when it's required, firm when it's required, saying no when I mean no yeah. and yes when I mean yes. Um, because this whole like politeness and tiptoeing around people's feelings is not helping anyone because then it's just creating false, falsity that we live in. So I try to be as real as possible. I mean, it means, doesn't mean being rude, <laughs> yeah. but it does mean like being, you know, being direct and honest about my feelings as well. Um, and always remembering to honor myself because if I'm strong in myself, then I'm giving you strength because you can only give what you have. Correct. You can't give what you don't have. And, and so it comes back to that, that practice of self and even you know, just really quickly, if I can tell you a little bit about my business partners. Yeah, sure. Like when I left that career, that, that fintech career, eventually I landed back into this uh, private equity firm, Alpha Investing, where I'm the VP of strategy. And the reason I joined them is because they have the same values as I do. There's four partners. And I felt like they wanted me as part of the team for me, not because of what you know, yeah, what I could do, I suppose, but not like a silver bullet, not just like, oh, look at her, she can do all these things for us. It was like, they saw me, they value me, we have the same values. We're a diverse leadership team, we're two women. Um, yeah, our CEO, Farkas, is, is uh, from Nigeria. So we're very diverse, and that's the leadership style, that's what we take out to the world in the, in the work that we do. Um, because aside from the personal development that's so important, I mean, we still have to live in this world. Yeah. So we need to materially live and build wealth. Um, and so they're a team that it's like, it's the best, honestly, it's like the best thing ever. Like it was like a synchronicity of me really knowing who I was and I didn't want to do the, the crazy tech scene anymore. I did that for so many years and it really was like, a big transition from the tech, the tech scene to <laughs> Or help people. Yeah, it's huge. And I was burnt out, to be honest. Like, I was burnt out. And, and, but I also realized, like, my passion for business and my passion for investing and for real estate. And it's somehow I magnetized the right people to me. And I love them. I love what we do. And that's that honoring myself and my boundaries and who I am. And um, it allows me to do this personal work, which is like my, my heart and soul. So I kind of feel like I have it all. So now you're huge into personal <laughs> development. Mm -hmm. But there was a point where you first got introduced to it and it was something very rare to you. Yeah. Um, you know, it's um, people who aren't introduced to that world, mm -hmm. they believe it's an inner world or an inner bubble yeah. um, that um, is a make-believe world. And, you know, only when you experience yeah. the whole visualization and then turning into, you know, actually manifesting what you want. Um, yeah. You know, it's a ritual. 
I mean, when you wake up every morning, it starts to become something. It's a pattern once again where you you visualize, you affirm, and you actually, you know, what starts to happen. I love I love living into the future mm. rather than living into the past or even the present. Mm. Um, and you know, when you're mentoring people, they have generally they don't have any education on personal development. Mm -hmm. How do you ca how do you coach and mentor someone from a newbie? How d where do they start? Mm, that's a great question because there's a lot of judgment around personal development or even spirituality, right? Like I always thought that it was, you know, donning the white robes and sitting on a mountaintop and then how am I going to live my life? Like it just didn't it didn't align with my ambitions. Um, but it's actually so much bigger than that. It's like you said, it's rituals and it's discipline. It's disciplining the mind more than anything because when we can discipline the mind, whether like meditation is one of my foundational practices because it stills the mind and helps me get into my body and into my inner self. Um, so that's like a foundational practice that we work with. And even visualization usually is with your eyes closed because you need to still the monkey mind that might get, you know, it goes off and does whatever it wants to do. And so I don't, I try to approach it in a way, the best way for me to put it is this. We talk about our vibration or our frequency energetically as people. And when we have a, a certain level, we're trying to entrain people up. We're trying to bring people's vibration up because that's how we manifest better. We manifest from love and joy and optimism. Um, but we have to meet people where they are mentally. And so it's a matter of understanding who I'm talking to and what is the best approach to help them relate to me. And then I can take them up a ladder of practices or um, philosophies or different things. But like if somebody starts with something practical like uh, mindset, which is a Carol, Carol Dweck's work, which is amazing. Um, it's the growth versus um, the fixed mindset. It's amazing work. Um, and so if it starts like that, or leadership practices, or some yeah. of the things that they recognize, and then I can take them, and then I can take them up and up and up as they start to open mentally and energetically and emotionally to being, uh, basically to being more open to receiving higher levels of, um, of knowledge. And it's not an overnight practice. Oh, no. <laughs> um, you know, I've, how, how long have you been involved in personal development for? Um, I started when I was 19. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so almost 19, 20 years. Yeah, I started <laughs> yeah. off at eight. And, um, but every successful, and you can define success or wealth, you know, I believe wealthy is when you have both time and money, freedom combined, mm -hmm. and success is just financial freedom. But every wealthy person out there who has their inner peace, outer abundance covered out, personal development is right up there. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone. I mean, you read any successful person's biography or autobiography. and it's a foundation. Foundational. Yeah. Even, like, old, like even people from, like, very far back in history, when you read about them, they had that. I mean... It was spiritual practice for them, which is the same as personal development. Yep. I mean, you all the way back to like the Greeks and like Marcus Aurelius, like you read his reflections, the 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 book, or um, Seneca, like the Stoics, like it. They were living that. That was their foundation, and then everything else was was. We have it backwards. We've got it flipped around. Yep. We put spirituality or personal development at the end of the day if we have time, and then and then we're caught in this life. And it's actually the other way around. We need to make that foundation, and then life, whatever we want to accomplish, comes from the foundation, and not the not the flip that is currently. And whilst life. you have that, you know, you still have to take action, though. Oh yeah. Because that's vital. <laughs> yeah. Uh, most people miss that part. They so mm -hmm. psych they psychologically aligned, and they excited, right. and they <laughs> they naturally high on life, and they willing, and they're waiting for the next opportunity to show up. You know, you to work. You yeah. Know, execute. Adapia, thank you so much for your time on the Millionaire Student Show. Thank you, Sasha. I appreciate it. And um, woman empowerment is rare, but without a doubt, you know, from a guy's perspective, um, you know, there's no scarcity mentality of women going out there and actually no. making a difference. That's right. You know, in the world. Thank you for your time. Thank you appreciate so much. It.